can't find him, talk to me, uh, and uh, we'll get you set up. Okay. All right, welcome to the uh, final plenary of the meeting. Uh, my name is Patrick Keeling, and I have the pleasure of introducing uh, John Eisen. Before I do, I just want to uh, say one quick word of thank you, uh, because like the first plenary, this plenary was supported by the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. And uh, as you heard already, this is a nonprofit organization that's been supporting research networks in Canada for the last 30 years. And in one form or another, uh, has been supporting microbial diversity and evolution in Canada for about 25 years. And so they have provided support for today's lecture as well. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce John for a few reasons. I've known him for, I guess, a long time now. We, did our PhDs at the same time on, on opposite sides of the continent. Um, so originally, John comes from the East Coast and did his, uh, his uh, undergraduate education at Harvard and then went on to Stanford for his PhD. From there, he went to Tiger, where he was on the faculty for many years before moving on to his current position at the University of California in Davis. So those of you that know John will know there's a few of his characteristics that go above and beyond his research of note. I think one of the first is his, his advocacy for open access and uh, the open, open science in general. He's a tireless communicator on the web and an advocate for, for free publication of uh, scientific results and is an editor of Floss Biology and um, so forth. Um, the other uh, non-scientific uh, point that I'd like to make about John is got also to do with his science communication is his advocacy for expanding the lexicon of words relating to omics. John's blog is an excellent source of information for new forms of omics that he uh, spreads to the scientific community so that those words can <coughs> go down in permanent history. Um, I just want to bring up a couple that John has highlighted because they're, uh, they're, they're omics that we don't often think about, but uh, but John has been responsible for, for perpetuating them. There's the sexome and the fermentome and the etome, and I'm hoping that today we hear a little bit about other kinds of omics that uh, John can share with us. So without any further ado, it's my pleasure to give the floor to John. I'm gonna kill you. Um, so I do write about omics words and how much I hate them. Uh, <laughs> But part of that is propagating, unfortunately, the, the words. And those aren't even close to the worst ones out there. Um, but uh, um, all right, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me here. And uh, as Patrick hinted at, um, we have a long connection. I owe a remarkable amount of my scientific progress to Canada. Um, when I was a graduate student, I was desperate to work on Halophilic archaea for long, sordid history of reasons. And I was talking to a friend of mine, Manish Razada, out on the steps at uh, Stanford. And he said, oh, this friend of his, Patrick Keeling, is in Fort Doolittle's lab. He'll hook you up. Um, and Patrick ended up helping me get strains and get started with cosmid libraries and other things from Fort Doolittle's lab and started one of my obsessions. I have a lot of obsessions. Um, one of my obsessions, which is with halophilic archaea. Um, so what I want to talk about today is phylogeny um, and the uses of phylogeny. And really, that, that's it. That's the whole point. Um, I'm going to give some examples and tell some stories. If anywhere along the way there are any questions, please stop me and ask, because really, I'm here to proselytize about phylogeny, and I want people to understand it. And if I don't get to the any, some of the examples, that's going to be fine. Um, and since I rarely get to the end, uh, <laughs> thought I would just acknowledge up front, um, I'm going to be talking about work sort of from throughout my career uh, that relates to phylogeny-driven approaches to analyzing genome and metagenomic data. And this has been supported by a lot of different funding agencies. And I've had an amazing collection of collaborators doing um, various aspects of this. I'm going to try and mention the people who participated in each of the studies, but I, I may forget. Um, so the first thing is, I assume most people here know this, but just a tiny little introduction on phylogeny, what is it? So what, what I mean by phylogeny, 
Um, and what most people mean is just a description of the evolutionary history of organisms, or of genes, or of some biological uh, objects. And this history, if it's simple, can be portrayed in this relatively simple diagram called a phylogenetic tree, which has um, bifurcation of you know, ancestral uh, organisms or genes splitting into two descendant lineages, and then those splitting into more descendant lineages. Evolutionary history can be much more complicated than that. Um, you can have recombination within populations. You can have lateral gene transfer between species. However you represent it, I'm still going to sort of refer to that as phylogeny, the gen just general evolutionary history um, of objects, even though in most cases we're going to draw that as a single bifurcating tree. We, we may either know or ignore or accept that, that things are more complicated behind that. And the stories that I'm going to tell you of using phylogeny, it doesn't matter per se what the actual tree is. I mean, you want to get as close to accurate to represent the evolutionary history, but if it's a complicated lateral gene transfer related history, incorporating that into your studies is going to be very important. Just as if it's just a simple bifurcating tree, incorporating that into your history. And I've sort of hinted at this, but, but what I'm talking about applies to species. So you can study the evolution of species, you can study the evolution of genomes, you can study the evolution of genes. And in essence, all of the examples I'm going to give you in some way can apply to any level within an organism. So um, what I want to do for the first sort of half of this talk is talk about examples of why phylogeny is useful in analysis of genomic data and metagenomic data. That's been most of what I've been focusing on for years. And now that sequencing has gotten pretty cheap um, and relatively easy to do, phylogeny is still an important approach to analyzing this type of data. So the first example I want to give you relates to phylotyping. Most people here are probably familiar with this because this has been done now for 20 plus years in studies of ribosomal RNA for microbes pioneered by Norm Pace and colleagues, and the general approach is to go to a sample, grind it up, extract the DNA, um, run ribosome RNA PCR, sequence the PCR products, and then to interpret what you find in those samples, you build an evolutionary tree of the ribosome RNAs that you get, and you compare them to the ribosome RNAs from other organisms. And so now you have a phylogenetic context for the, un, you know, the organisms that you're studying via their DNA. And this is generally called phylotyping. And I've been doing this for a long time. So as an undergraduate at Harvard, I worked with Colin Cavanaugh on hydrothermal vent symbionts and other chemosynthetic symbionts. This is my, a figure from my first scientific paper where you could get a paper out of sequencing a single 16S ribosome RNA gene. <laughs> took, took a year and a half. Um, kind of sickening what you can do now with sequencing. Um, and the point of this is not just to give a name to an organism, in some cases you can't do this, but one of the main points of this is to place an organism in its context. So for example, if you, if you don't know much about the biology of the organism, you can make hypotheses based upon the biology of relatives of that organism that have been studied in more detail. So phylotyping is a very powerful tool for making some types of predictions about um, the biology of organisms. As sequencing has gotten cheaper and cheaper, we're doing more and more phylotyping, either because we can do more ribosome RNA PCR because it's so cheap, or now metagenomics, where we go to an environment, grind up a sample, and just shotgun sequence the DNA from the sample. And phylotyping is really important in these types of studies. So you can go through metagenomic data. We did this for the original sort of Sargasso C metagenome scan through it for ribosome RNA genes and do the exact same thing you would do with PCR amplified ribosome RNA genes. Build phylogenetic trees, place the ribosome RNAs into some context compared to other ribosome RNAs. The great thing about metagenomics for phylotyping is it has allowed us for really the first time to do broad phylotyping with other markers, not just small subunit ribosome RNA genes because we get, there's been a it's hard to PCR amplify from a broad diversity of organisms, protein coding genes, because of the degeneracy of the genetic code. Ribosome RNA PCR primers work well, but for other genes, they don't work as well. With random shotgun data, you get all sorts of other genes, and you can ask, 
do I get the same result with these other genes as I get with ribosome RNA? So um, yet another one of my obsessions has been the RecA gene uh, involved in homologous recombination, and that was the first thing I scanned through the Sargasso C metagenome data for, and you can classify taxa just like you would with ribosome RNA using this protein coding gene. We selected five protein coding genes to scan through the Sargasso C data, EF2, EFG, HSP70, RecA, and RPOB. We picked these because these had been broadly used as phylogenetic markers for bacteria, and we wanted to see if we got similar results. So one thing that you can do with phylotyping that I didn't mention is in addition to assigning organisms to a taxonomic group, you can count um, organisms that go to different taxonomic groups. And in essence, you're estimating relative abundance of organisms from the counts that you get of the sequences that get assigned to a particular group. And if you do this for protein coding genes in metagenomic data versus ribosome RNA genes in metagenomic data, you sometimes get different results. And frequently, the protein coding genes that we've used give similar numbers to each other that are different from the ribosome RNA genes. And we think that this is due to variation in copy number of ribosome RNA genes between taxa. So many of the protein coding genes that we were using were relatively even in copy number across taxa, one or two copies or occasionally zero. Whereas ribosome RNA in bacteria can vary from one to 15. And if you go into, what are those things with a nucleus? The humans? Yeah, humans. Uh, microbial eukaryotes, the variation is immense in some of them. Um, and so if you can and you want to get relative abundance data, it's probably better if you have metagenomic data to use single copy genes than it is to use genes that vary in copy number in unpredictable um, ways. Another use for phylotyping is sorting through the metagenomic data. So one important thing with analyzing metagenomic data is something called binning. You go to the environment, you have lots of organisms in the environment, there's all this structure in the environment, and you blast it apart. And then you shotgun sequence these small pieces of DNA and you don't know where they came from. And a very important bioinformatic exercise is sorting the reads that come from these metagenomic samples into bins that correspond to species or genera or some taxonomic grouping of organisms. The best way to do this is if you have reference genomes, genomes from close relatives of organisms in your environmental sample, and then you can tile the reads against the reference genomes, much like people do with RNA sequencing now um, with a reference genome. This is happening in many environments, so if you're lucky enough to study like the human microbiome, there are thousands now of reference genomes that you can tile the metagenomic reads against. If you study many other ecosystems, we don't yet have reference genomes to sort through a lot of the data. So if you don't have a reference genome, what do you do? How do you bin the data? There are lots of approaches that have been developed, and some of them are, are very useful. Um, one approach that we've been working on is phylogeny. So you can take all the reads from a sample and build phylogenetic trees of everything in the sample, not just Rec A, RPOB, HSP70. Assign everything to taxonomic groups, and now you have bins that correspond to phylogenetically assigned reads from the sample. We originally did this with very simple samples, like um, these are symbionts from the glassy wing sharpshooter, an uh, insect that has um, symbionts that live inside of its gut, and you can classify all of the reads, again, including anything that you can get in the sample that has a homolog somewhere in the database, and this helps you sort through the data. As um, we go to more and more complicated environments, building phylogenetic trees of everything is not quite as easy, and I'll come back to this uh, in a couple of minutes. Another very useful thing that most people who probably do ribosome RNA sequencing are very familiar with is something you could call phylogenetic ecology. So if you want to compare two samples to each other um, in the environment, one way to do this, and historically what a lot of people did, was to make a list of the taxa from environment one and compare it to a list of the taxa from environment two. That's sort of taxonomic diversity comparisons between environments. So in essence, you sequence your genes from an environment, you cluster the genes into groups, OTUs, that correspond to something we might want to call a species, and now you compare presence and absence of OTUs across your environmental samples. A more robust way to do the comparison, and David Roman may have men mentioned some of this, um, in essence he's doing a lot of this, is to um, build phylogenetic trees of all your sequences and then compare your samples based upon the phylogenetic diversity of the samples. That's what UNIFRAC, uh, Rob Knight's program that a lot of people use in Chime and other software packages does. It uses the phylogenetic tree to compare the samples to each other so that 
two taxa, if they're in the same genus, don't count as much difference as two taxa that are, say, in different phyla. So this phylogenetic approach to ecology is very commonly used in plant and animal studies and only recently really taken off in microbial studies with the increase in the number of sequences that people are getting from environmental samples. Um, just as an aside, there's one major challenge still with doing phylotyping, uh, which is you can scan through the data, build phylogenetic trees of stuff, and sometimes you get things that sit in between groups where there's nothing that you have a name for that your sequence groups with, so it's sort of distantly related from anything that is out there. Uh, an extreme example of this is when we scan through metagenomic data to look at protein coding genes, we find in almost every protein family that we look at, sequences that do not group into either bacteria, archaea, eukaryotes, or any known virus clade. What these are, we have no idea what they are. They could be new viruses, they could be ancient paralogs of genes, they could be weird deep branching members of some of these existing clades, they could be a fourth branch on the tree of life. We have no idea what these sequences are because they end up as outgroups or deep branches compared to everything else that we have some traction on. So phylotyping works best when you have sequences that are reasonably closely related to something else in your database that you can sort of assign it to a group. So I'm going to switch um, from phylogenetic typing to talking about another use of phylogeny in genomic and metagenomic analysis, which involves making predictions of functions for genes. Um, so as sequencing has gotten cheaper and cheaper, but even you know, eight, 10 years ago, um, one of the most important things that you can do with sequence data is to try and predict the functions of the genes found in that sequence data. As we sequence more and more things that don't have experimental studies associated with them, these hypotheses, these predictions, are getting to be more and more important because we're overwhelmed with sequence data. We need to be able to drive experimental studies in the right direction, and these predictions of functions can be very beneficial to guiding experimental studies. There are many different approaches to doing this, so the simplest is what can be called homology-based approaches or similarity-based approaches, where you take your sequence, search it against the database of other sequences with programs like BLAST, and then you look for whether or not your sequence has a matching sequence in the database. You can do this for very short regions of your sequence, looking for motifs, or you can do it looking for, say, whole other sequences that are highly similar or homologous um, if they, you conclude that they share a common ancestry to your sequence of interest. And one problem with this that has been noted for a long time is if you do, say, a BLAST search for the sequence of interest and you find a lot of homologs in the database, very frequently um, you get a list of functions of those homologs where not all of them have the same function. So maybe the homologs have 10 different functions. What do you do? How do you sort through that data and pick a putative function for your new sequence? One way to do this is to just pick the best hit, the top match. That's um, very disconcerting to people obsessed with phylogeny because similarity is not an accurate predictor of evolutionary relatedness. Things can be very similar to each other but not be sister taxa in an evolutionary tree. And so one reason to build trees of data instead of measure similarity alone is because of this misleading relationship between similarity and phylogeny. And so I'm just going to tell a little uh, quick story. Do you have a... I don't have my timer running, so... Uh, yeah, it's awesome. I'll never do it back. Um, okay. Um, so I'm just going to tell a quick story that um, relates to this. It's an old story, but it's still relevant. So when I was a graduate student, started to become obsessed with genome data, and I was hacking my way through the genomes that are coming out of Tiger, and I kept telling lots of people that we should be building phylogenetic trees of all these sequences rather than doing glass searches of all the sequences. And um, the Helicobacter pylori, that's this organism here, genome was coming out in, I think, Nature, and uh, Rick Myers at Stanford got asked to write a news and views about the genome coming out. And so he wrote to me and he's like, yeah, you keep arguing about these phylogenies. Do something. 
So find me something that we can tell about in, in this genome where phylogenies helps. And amazingly, the first thing I looked at, it actually was useful because I read the paper that came out of Tiger and there was this really interesting result in the paper which was they reported that Helicobacter pylori likely had the process of DNA mismatch repair. I'll get back to what that is in a second. Their conclusion was based upon a BLAST search, this BLAST search. So they searched one of the sequences in Helicobacter pylori against the database um, and they came back with this BLAST search result where the top six hits um, all were annotated as DNA mismatch repair protein. And so they predicted that Helicobacter pylori had DNA mismatch repair based upon this result. And what I noticed, which was very unusual, was that the organism had this gene, this homologue of the E. coli mutas, but not a homologue of the E. coli mutal. And this was interesting. I was working on evolution of DNA mismatch repair. This was interesting because in all organisms that had been found to have this process of mismatch repair, they always used homologs of mutas and mutal. So the way the process works is after DNA replication, errors can get put in during replication. The mismatch repair complex scans through the newly replicated DNA to look for mismatches. If a base was put in incorrectly, the newly replicated DNA should be wrong. So it chops out a region of the newly replicated DNA and that gets resynthesized. And this was found in E. coli, B. subtilis, yeast, humans, Arabidopsis, across the tree of life, in essence, and always required mutas and mutal homologs. This was the first organism to have a mutas, but not a mutal. To make a long story short, if you build an evolutionary tree of mutas homologs, it turns out they are not all you know, the same. If you build a tree and you overlay onto that tree, shown in color, the experimentally determined functions, not the names in a database that someone put there as a hypothesis, or guess, um, uh, you overlay the functions, in red are the genes involved in mismatch repair, and blue are the genes involved in meiotic chromosome segregation. And you can see that there are some clades in this tree where many of the genes are involved in mismatch repair. You might predict that the other members of those clades are involved in mismatch repair. There's a clade over here where none of the genes had been experimentally studied at the time. And this clade is actually more closely related to a clade to a group that's involved in meiotic chromosome segregation than it is to groups involved in mismatch repair. Here's the Helicobacter pylori gene. It's in this clade where no one has ever studied the function. You might not want to predict that this organism has mismatch repair based upon this phylogenetic tree. The absence of mutal also suggests that you might not want to predict that this organism has mismatch repair. To make a long story short, it appears that Helicobacter pylori and many of its relatives do not have mismatch repair. So um, building a phylogenetic tree can help give you context to the presence and absence of particular members of gene families that is much richer than just doing a BLAST search. So when I did this, I then outlined sort of a general approach, taking a sequence, finding homologs, and rather than just looking at the list of BLAST search results, building phylogenetic trees of those sequences. And then using the structure in the phylogenetic tree to predict functions for unknown genes. You can use parsimony character state reconstruction methods, for example, to predict functions for unknown genes. Now, I called this phylogenomics. I invented a bad omics word. I apologize um, for that. It's stuck, unfortunately. Um, and uh, it, you know, I, 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 I like to think that this was a creative use of phylogeny, but really, all I did was steal it. So this is, conceptually identical to phylotyping for predicting the function of an organism. It's the exact same thing, but now applied to gene function. So there's, actually probably works better for gene function uh, when you do it for organisms. You know, uh, organisms that are closely related on a ribosome RNA tree can frequently have a lot of differences in function, either due to lateral gene transfer or gene loss or evolution of novelty. Function appears to be a little bit more constrained within phylogenies inside protein families than it does among organisms in the ribosome RNA tree. But it's literally the identical approach to phylotyping, but it's functional phylotyping. You can apply this to metagenomic data, so we've done this with proteoridopsins. You can apply it to any type of sequence that you can build a tree of and compare the sequences to homologs. So this method, I think, works great, but it fails in many, many, many cases. And the reason it fails in many cases is that if you do a search with a sequence, Instead of finding a lot of genes that have different function, 
what you frequently find is a lot of genes for which nobody has studied the function. The so-called conserved hypothetical proteins. And if you get this list, you can be very frustrated and say, oh my god, I've got all these homologs, but I can't predict the function of any of them because no one has studied the function of any of them. About uh, oh, a little over 10 years ago now, um, uh, Pellegrini and David Eisenberg and a few other people um, de described this method called phylogenetic profiling, which is an example of a new approach to predicting functions for genes that actually Prior to their description of this, there were a few other people that had also suggested this approach for predicting functions. But it's an example of what are called non-homology functional prediction methods, where you try and predict functions based upon some feature other than just the sequence similarity of your gene to genes in other organisms. And the way phylogenetic profiling works is really cool. You take genes of interest, you search them against a database of genomes. You build a profile of those genes. Yes, no, yes, yes, no. Are they found? present or absent across these taxa. And then you group genes by their distribution patterns, their profile, across organisms, rather than looking just for sequence similarity to genes of known function. And what you get are these clusters of genes that are frequently involved in the same general function in an organism. For example, we did this for this organism, Carboxidothermus hydrogeniformans, a sporulating member of the Firmicutes. And you can find these great clusters across the sporulating organisms where many of the genes that are found across these organisms are predicted to be sporulation proteins. But many of them are annotated as conserved hypothetical proteins. They're found in all the sporulating organisms, not any of the non-sporulating organisms. You can predict that these genes are likely involved in sporulation based upon this correlated distribution pattern of genes. Um, I'm going to come back to something else related to that in, in a minute. But this sort of phylogenetic profiling is a very powerful tool for making predictions of functions of genes. So the third example of using phylogeny in the context of genomic studies is sort of a bigger picture example, and it relates to how you pick organisms to do the studies on in the first place. So uh, this is a figure, series of slides I made about 10 years ago now, although amazingly the same phenomenon is still true, but 10 years ago, um, there were about 40 or so phyla of bacteria that had been um, given a name to and sort of generally agreed upon as existing. Most of the genomes at the time came from three of those 40 phyla. The proteobacteria, the actinobacteria, and the firmicutes. The actinobacteria are also known as the high GC gram positives, firmicutes the low GC gram positives. But that's where most of the genomes came from. There were a scattering of a few other genomes available from a few of the other phyla, but the, there was enormous bias in the availability of genomes from across the bacterial phylogeny. The same trend was, and alas, still is true in eukaryotes. We need to fix that, um, all of you protistologists and folks. Um, the same trend is also true in viruses and in archaea. So there's this phy incredible phylogenetic bias in the availability of genome data. And so when I, um, I had started a small project on this when I was a tiger that was funded by the NSF Tree of Life program. And then when I moved to Davis, I had an adjunct appointment at the Joint Genome Institute, and we launched what we call the Genomic Encyclopedia of Bacteria and Archaea, where we are explicitly taking the ribosome RNA tree of bacteria and archaea, walking through it and finding branches for which there are no genomes available or in progress. And if um, we can culture those organisms, or more specifically, if the German culture collection, the DSMZ, which is our partner, can culture one of these organisms, we will grow it and sequence its genome. And um, this has been this massive operation at the Department of Energy Joint Genome Institute, along with the DSMZ, involving hundreds of people, the full sort of force of the DOE Joint Genome Institute behind this to sequence genomes. And we've gotten up to maybe about 300 genomes now, walking through the bacterial and archaeal tree. And what I'm going to tell you briefly is some of the lessons that we've learned from this project related to phylogeny sequencing. So um, it's a little surprising to me that this hadn't been done extensively in bacteria and archaea. It's been done in animals. That's why the National Human Genome Research Institute is going through and doing a marsupial and a monotreme and a, a amphibian and a reptile and, you know, one of those flying reptiles. Sorry for the phylogeneticist, a bird. Um, and... Um, going all the way through the phylogeny of vertebrates to fill in the tree. And that's why plant people are going through the phylogeny of plants 
but this has not, had not been done extensively in bacteria. And um, so we've now done this, we're continuing to do this, and we've learned a lot from this project. So the first important thing is that if you use the ribosomal RNA novelty of an organism in the ribosomal RNA tree, that tends to be a very good predictor of the sort of novelty of the core housekeeping genes in the genome. So if you build a phylogeny, a concatenated phylogeny of the core housekeeping genes in the genome of organisms, you roughly get a similar picture of the novelty as you would with the ribosomal RNA tree. That doesn't mean the trees are identical to each other. So the 16S ribosomal RNA tree sometimes gives you a slightly or significantly different picture than these whole genome trees or even than trees of other genes. But on average, if something shows up as being novel in the 16S tree, it's usually very novel in the tree of the other phylogenetic marker genes. Much more important for our funders, the Department of Energy, was that we were able to show, as we, could have, as we predicted and as people had shown for vertebrates and plants, that improving your phylogenetic sampling of organisms improves your ability to annotate genomes. So by having more members within protein families, by linking together what you previously thought to be unrelated protein families, by providing more context for particular gene families, you can improve your ability to predict functions in other organisms, say model organisms like even E. coli, by having this phylogenetic sampling of genomes. Just a little side story, this doesn't relate to phylogeny per se, but if anybody is sequencing genomes out there and you know, struggling with what to do with the genomes, now that you know, I could have published a paper on one 16S ribosome RNA gene 10 or so years ago, but now it's hard to publish a paper on a single genome in many journals, the genome data is very useful if you attach metadata to it. So if you have information about how the organism grew, where it was from, is it aerobic or anaerobic, and, and other details of that organism, releasing that data into some shareable archive is very powerful for other people to make use of your genome. There's now a journal that is dedicated, in essence, to doing this called SIGS, the Standards in Genome Sciences. I'd be happy to talk to people more about this uh, afterwards if you want to talk about uh, metadata. And probably the most important uh, thing that came out of this phylogeny-driven genome sequencing project was that Sampling across genetic diversity, uh, phylogenetic diversity, improved our ability to collect genetic diversity, protein family diversity in particular. So we predicted this, but many people um, who uh, heard about our plans for this project were very skeptical of this possibility. So there are many studies that show that lateral gene transfer is important in the evolution of lots of organisms, including bacteria and archaea. And, you know, for example, if you sequence 10 strains within a species, the, gene, the genomes of those strains are frequently different from each other, and two E. coli strains can differ by up to 40% of their genome content, um, largely due to things like introgression of plasmids and phage and some amount of lateral gene transfer. So if lateral gene transfer is really common, really rapid, then it might be that the ribosomal RNA tree and even the tree of housekeeping genes in the genome is not a good predictor of diversity of anything else in the genomes of those organisms. Because if genes can move around really fast, it may not just be a good predictor of any sort of diversity in the rest of the genomes of these organisms. So we did a little test of this, which was a rarefaction curve for protein families. And the way we do this is we take a data set of multiple complete genomes. And for that data set, we identify protein families across those genomes. And then we sample the genomes. We take out genome one and we say, how many protein families are in genome one? And then we take out genome two and we ask, how many new protein families relative to genome one did genome two add? And we do that with genome three and so on. And we get a plot, in essence, of the rate of recovery of protein families per genome. So we did this um, for this one species, Streptococcus agalactiae. It's an interesting um, pathogen, but it's of interest here because it's where Hervé Tetelin and Claire Frazier and others at Tiger had described what's now known as the pan genome. Um, they had shown that every strain you sequence within this species um, added new protein, new genes every time you sequenced a new genome. So there's a lot of genetic diversity within a species. And we see the same result as you add more and more genomes in this data set. 
you get more and more, not just genes, that's what they looked at, but novel protein families compared to the other genomes. So the, the diversity is not just an orphan gene, it's actually a new protein family in essence. And we're not counting here the things that are just present in one genome. So it has to be conserved to get counted here. However, if you do the same analysis for genomes that are slightly more distantly related from each other within a family, so here we chose the Enterobacteriaceae, the rate of recovery of protein families per genome is higher than if you do this within a species. If you do this within a phylum, the rate of recovery of protein families per genome is even higher. And if you do it across the bacteria and archaea for our phylogenetically novel organisms, it's the highest. So if you want to find new protein families, one way to do that is to select phylogenetically novel organisms. Now this doesn't mean that lateral gene transfer doesn't occur, it just means that the phylogenetic backbone, as predicted by the ribosomal RNA, is a good predictor of finding protein family novelty within genomes. What I think this means in terms of phylogeny is that synapomorphies exist. So if you're not a phylogenetic geek, you may not know what synapomorphies are. So synapomorphies are a term commonly used in studies of plant and animal evolution. They are shared derived traits present within one clade. So milk in mammals, um, and uh, you know, wings, feathered wings in birds, and a lot of other features we find throughout plant and animal diversity. If lateral gene transfer is occurring at an incredibly high rate, we would not expect to find synapomorphies within any branch within the tree of life, but we do. We see certain types of synapomorphies, say, among all cyanobacteria, the type of photosynthesis proteins that they have. It gets weeded out by lateral gene transfer. Things can pick up genes from across taxa, so the synapomorphies may not last quite as long as they do in plant and animal evolution, but they definitely last. So the last thing I want to talk about in terms of this uh, lessons learned is the, the benefits for studying uncultured organisms. So I'm not going to show you all the details, but we had hoped that the Genomic Encyclopedia Project would improve our ability to characterize uncultured organisms, and um, it did, but very, very little. So when we tried to classify phylotype reads from environmental samples, we thought improving phylogenetic sampling has got to allow us to better do this. Ribosomal RNA phylotyping works great because there are like you know, 200 million sequences available for ribosomal RNA genes. For RecA, the next most, the most sequenced bacterial protein, there were like 3,000 sequences. So sequencing genomes is a great way to increase the phylogenetic diversity of other genes from across the genomes of organisms. And even by doing that, we did not improve our ability to classify metagenomic data very well. Um, so it's 9.30, so how much? Uh... Okay. Um, all right, so I lied to you, basically, is what I want to tell you. Um, the methods that we, I've been describing so far are completely insufficient to take advantage of the new sequence data that's out there. Um, we need to do a much better job with all of our approaches and all of our methods, and what I'm gonna do really quickly is just mention some of these. So we need to improve our ability to do phylotyping, for example, to make sense out of metagenomic data. Um, that's both because we're getting massive new amounts of data, because sequencing is getting really cheap, um, and because the size of the reads that we're getting has unfortunately shrunk uh, although it's going back up again, relative to Sanger sequencing where we were getting 1,000 base pair reads, we're now getting, say, 100 or 150 base pair reads with Illumina sequencing. That doesn't have a lot of phylogenetic information in it. So we need new methods, and I'm just going to quickly walk through this. I apologize for uh, scanning through a bunch of slides. So one approach for building phylogenetic trees of sequences is to treat each sequence as an island, I would call this. So you can go through a sequence database, build a reference tree of everything in your reference database, and then each new sequence from your environmental sample, you just build relative to the reference tree. So you're classifying the new sequence, but only relative to the reference tree. And that's very useful. It can phylotype your sequence, but it doesn't place them in context relative to each other. We can do that with proteins. We can do that with ribosome RNA. We've built automated methods to do this. One is called Amphora. I'm happy to talk to people about this later. A much better approach is to try and analyze 
all of the new sequences relative to each other, not just relative to the reference database. And I would call this most in the family. So if you want to build, if you have an alignment like this and you want to build a tree of all the sequences, including these ones that I've labeled here, which are from, say, an environmental sample, fragment, fragment, fragment. One way to try and build a tree of these all together, which is what we did for many years, is to just find the sequences that cover at least a reasonable proportion of your full alignment and build a tree of that sort of core of your alignment and throw away anything that doesn't cover a lot of that core. So throw away things that are from outside that set. And that's what we did with the Sargasso data. That's how I built ribosome RNA trees from the metagenomes and RecA trees and RPOB trees. We sort of constrained it to three quarters of the full alignment from the reference data. Um, another thing that you can do, um, oh, I'm gonna just skip over that. Um, what would be nice to do is to build a tree of everything to include all of the sequences. And this can be really challenging because if you try to do this, some of your sequences won't overlap at all with each other. So how do you place sequences into one global tree without when they don't overlap with each other at all? In essence, the, the way to do this these days is a hybrid approach where you have a reference tree, you pull in sequences one at a time, but you actually try and figure out how those sequences map relative to each other in addition to how they map relative to the reference tree. There are a few methods out there available to do this. pplacer is one of them. Um, we've developed this in Amphora, and we have new software called Phylosif that is working on, um, on doing this. And then finally, the ultimate in doing this is to try, rather than all the genes within a single family, to try and analyze all the genes in genomes all at once. So try and combine together the data from all the different genes at one time. This is important because Metagenomics gives you lots of data, but shallow coverage of each gene. And so if you want to really understand the diversity in a system, it would be good to combine the data from RecA, RPOB, et cetera, into a single tree. And in essence, you can do the same approach. You build a whole genome tree with a concatenated alignment of different markers. And now you, instead of just pulling different fragments of genes, you can now have different genes anchored into that reference tree, and you can compare them relative to each other. Um, Stephen Kemble, uh, who was a postdoc in Jessica Green's lab, developed a method to do this. We had a paper that came out last year where he used this and then used this to do, in essence, unifrac, phylogenetic ecology, across lots of genes in metagenomic data rather than just with ribosomal RNA data. We also need to analyze more gene families. So um, the protein families that we've been looking at were basically based upon a paper from 10 years ago that we developed, 31 protein coding genes, but there are many more protein coding genes that would be useful phylogenetic markers. We've been scanning through genomes to identify new phylogenetic markers, both for all organisms, as well as clade-specific phylogenetic markers. So, you know, if you look within the cyanobacteria, for example, there are 590 genes that appear to be useful phylogenetic markers for classifying cyanobacteria. It's a lot more than the 31 marker genes we were using from across all genomes. By analyzing protein families, we can also improve our ability to do functional predictions from metagenomic data. So in this case, we need not just phylogenetic marker genes, but all protein families. And as sequence data is accumulating and accumulating and accumulating, it's getting painful to keep up and even have a list of all protein families that are known. So we've been working on automated methods to scan through all protein families to cluster them into, uh, all proteins, cluster them into families using a Markov chain clustering algorithm, and then build hidden Markov models for each of those families and use those to then classify metagenomic data. So in essence, you're trying to automatically go through protein family landscape and find new protein families. And because, you know, someone just announced a million genome, microbial genome project. Everything that we have to do here has to be automated because the amount of data that's coming out is just ridiculous. So we have a paper that's been submitted uh, describing these new protein families. The database is already out there on GitHub. If you want to look at all these protein families, you can have them. Uh, send me an email. The, the paper probably will be out relatively soon uh, anyway. But we release all the data um, and all the code for all these things for anybody to use. Um, so I'm just going to in the interest of time.
uh, skip over a couple of things. And so one thing that we need on top of all of this is um, we would like to have a better reference tree. So many of the methods lock a reference tree and then we thread sequences against that reference tree. So we're continually working on trying to make the reference tree better. Um, we don't know an ideal solution to this. We've um, uh, tried to use some more modern methods that account for variation among individual genes. Um, like there's a program called Bucky and there are a few other tools out there. Um, this is sort of an unsolved problem in an area that would benefit greatly from new sort of phylogenetic approaches. So the last thing I want to talk about is that again, I have sort of lied to you. Um, so the Genome Encyclopedia Project, we've done 300 plus genomes or so and we're very happy with these 300 plus genomes. Um, but really we've barely scratched the surface of microbial diversity out there. So if you look at the ribosome RNA tree of life, which is growing many new branches every day with new ribosome RNA sequencing, and many of those branches are actually real rather than chimeras or things like that. Um, but so the ribosome RNA data that we have is continually increasing. But even if we lock that data, so we locked the data about three years ago and said, what is the total phylogenetic diversity in the ribosome RNA tree? We can count the branch length in the tree, that's this metric known as PD, or phylogenetic diversity. And if we did this at that time, we counted the diversity of all of the sequenced genomes. We sorted them by the most distantly related in this set, so you know, Thermatoga versus Methanococcus or something to that effect. And then um, many of the genomes are 72 strains of E. coli or anthrax, so they don't add much phylogenetic diversity. Um, but in this space, we measured about 25 units of PD in the sequence genomes. Our genomic encyclopedia project, each genome adds a lot of PD to the data set. It better, that's how we selected the genomes for sequencing. If you look at cultured organisms, shown in this dark gray, we would need maybe about 2,000 more genomes to capture half of the phylogenetic diversity of cultured bacteria. That is happening now, so we're zooming in. The Genomic Encyclopedia Project is now zooming in on different clades. We're doing halophilic archaea in my lab. Cheryl Perfeld is doing cyanobacteria at the JGI. Many other people are doing, sort of zooming in within individual clades to try and fill in the, the sample cultured diversity of organisms. And basically all cultured species will be done in the next two or three years. However, most of the phylogenetic diversity of bacteria and archaea is in uncultured organisms, organisms that have never been grown in the lab. And even when we locked this data, you know, three or four years ago and constrained it to only full-length ribosome RNA sequences, this probably represents a hundredth of the diversity of bacteria and archaea. To sample half of that diversity, we would need something like 25,000 genomes. And these are from organisms that have never been grown in the laboratory. So how do we do that? How do we get genomes from organisms that have never been grown in the laboratory? It turns out there are a lot of people working on this. You can try and culture them. Um, or you can apply a lot of diverse methods to try and acquire the genomes from organisms out in environmental samples. The latest that a lot of people are doing is metagenomic assembly has actually gotten better and better and better. Jill Banfield has shown this in many studies recently where they're able to assemble complete genomes of uncultured organisms even from complicated samples. So we need those genomes desperately to have these broad phylogenetic benefits to things like annotation, discovery of protein family diversity, and anchoring, annotating, finding uh, taxa and metagenomic data sets. There's a big project now, the Genomic Encyclopedia Project that JGI has spun off into what could be called the GIBA Uncultured Project, which is being run by Tanya Wojcicki at JGI, and they're trying to fill in the full diversity of bacteria and archaea. Um, and I'll just uh, leave it at, at this. Um, sequencing is grand. I love sequencing. That's all I know how to do, pretty much. Um, but uh, sequencing is just the first step. So capturing sequence diversity from across the tree of life is insufficient. We need experiments from across these organisms. The, the bias that I showed you in genome sequencing is perhaps even greater in experimental studies from across the tree of life. So in order to figure out what all of this genetic diversity means, we need people to start working on these phylogenetically diverse genomes. The JGI actually has an Adopt-a-Micro program for the genomes that are being sequenced by the Genome Encyclopedia Project. Cheryl Perfeld at the JGI is 
teaching teachers how to make use of this data. They run workshops for college and now high school teachers to come in and get trained in how to use the data and then hopefully some of those people will actually do experiments <coughs> on the organisms that they adopt. And when this happens, when we have experimental studies as well as the genome data from across the tree of life, then we will have a real sort of rich phylogenetic texture in order to use phylogeny to take advantage of all of this data that's uh, out there. And I will end on that. Thank you. Yeah, well, we started five minutes late, so we have a bit of time for questions. Um, if anyone wants to uh, use the microphone. Yeah. I think the microphones work. Oh, great. Um, you're doing a lot of sequencing with the GIBA project, uh, program. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you're only doing it to draft level, or are you trying to close the circles? And what's the advantage of one versus the other? Yeah, so when the question is about how, whether we finish the genomes. Um, when the project started, all of them were sent to the Department of Energy Joint Genome Institute's finishing teams some of which were at the JGI, most of which were at Los Alamos National Lab. Um, so all of the genomes were being finished at the beginning of the project, and we finished so far maybe 200 or so of them. Um, during the course of the project, these you know, new technologies like 454 sequencing and Illumina sequencing came out, and finishing genomes stayed expensive. Sequencing genomes became ridiculously cheap. And so the choice became, should I sequence a thousand more genomes or should I finish four? And uh, the decision, not my decision at the JGI, but the decision was to phase out finishing for this project. Important landmark organisms are still being sent to finishing, so the first representative of a major clade is still being finished um, at, I think, Los Alamos, but Many of the genomes are not being finished. They're being taken to what's called sort of cleaned up draft sequencing. So you do deep sequencing with Illumina, maybe some packed bio coverage to get scaffolds for the genome, and then bioinformatic cleanup of the assemblies, and then um, wash your hands of it and, and move on. And for this project, so I believe in finishing genomes is very useful. I study the evolution of chromosome structure uh, in many cases, and I really want to know the arrangement of genes relative to each other and the, the, the constructions of chromosomes. For this project, for all of the benefits that we argue come for this project, there is no benefit I can come up with for finishing. So, so I can't argue that for this project, finishing is needed. I mean, there are some subtleties with if you want to infer a lot of gene transfer and you have to completely clean up the genome, it's a little bit complex. But for discovering new genetic diversity, for anchoring metagenomic data, for phylotyping, for all of these things, uh, a nearly finished genome is just as good as a, um, a finished genome. Again, for other reasons, I'd like to have a finished genome, but I, I can't argue with their decision. I can yell or answer yeah. that. your question. Okay, so um, arguably, the most important step in phylogenetic profiling or experimental approaches to um, uh, identifying function for these unknown genes would be updating historical annotations. And I'm just wondering how efficient is that pipeline uh, for updating these old annotations of genomes or DNAs? Yeah, and so um, I mean, the first I agree with you in part on your question, you're stating a little bit. Um, because uh, if you ask when have 50% of the genomes that we currently have been produced, it was in the last three months. Uh, most of the genome data, even though it's from important organisms that was generated initially, most of the data is from last week and will continue to be from when we provide an exponential curve, everything is recent. So if we have good methods to annotate the new genome, it would start to take over. And even if we didn't fix the old poorly annotated or just didn't need to update annotation, it wouldn't matter that much. As long as we did a good job with the new ones, 
So I think actually the bigger problem is that um, annotation is still not ideal in the way we do it. And we need to update some of the sort of model organisms. So for example, when experiments are done, linking that back to the annotation, whether it's a new organism or an old organism, is still challenging. So we're we're just putting together a proposal with Adam Martin and with some other functional genomics people to do a functional Kiva project. So to take all of these taxa, many of which have one paper on them describing the isolation of the organism, we can turn all of them into models. If you can get targeted knockouts, if you can do various functional genomics studies, we could build a lot of experimental data on these organisms very quickly. Um, and so I do think a lot of the data is going to be new. And figuring out how to actually take functional genomic data, high throughput genetics, high throughput biochemistry, et cetera, and get into the annotation, I think that's still not solved. In addition, we need to update coli and subtests and all the other model organisms, and that's also not solved. I mean, so I agree with the general statement, but I focus more on recent studies. We'll take one more. Julian, can you turn that microphone on? I've got it. Um, I want you to make a prediction. Um, given the fact that there's, I think the second genome to be sequenced was lambda, and it's um, quite small. Um, when would you predict that we will completely understand lambda biology? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, never. Uh, I mean, I think that some of the sequences just a template for human biology. It makes a lot of things easier. The more sequence you have, the easier it is to sort through magnetic data. But sorting through magnetic data is just the first step. It doesn't tell you, I mean, you need to do it. So I, I view the sequence data as a baseline layer that is very helpful to have. Um, and the better we do with that data, the more we can guide experimental studies. But you know, the classic, I mean, not lambda, but the classic example from, say, E. coli is that. There are genes that you can't knock out, right? That people haven't figured out how to do sort of traditional genetics with, and they're searching for alternative ways to study function. Polygraphy now and biochemistry of that. Um, that's just, you know, biochemistry outside of the cell is, you know, not necessarily telling you everything going on. So, Lambda, right? 20 yards. <laughs> Well, that sounds like a perfect uh, closing remark. I'd like to